There exists a hidden world of microorganisms beyond what we can see with our unaided eyes. Over a hundred years ago, this world was discovered through the progress of science. It was a huge leap forward for mankind. Scientific medicine came to understand how germs cause disease. We washed our hands, sterilized surgery, and created vaccines, antibiotics, and drugs that work. Life expectancy doubled in less than 50 years. But now the happy story starts to falter. Today, a war is being fought against reason. Science is treated with suspicion, perhaps born of fear, and medical advance is challenged by the march of irrational belief. A third of us now spend over 1.6 billion pounds a year on superstitious alternative remedies, which, as far as the evidence can show, don't work. OK? Yep. Good. Have you asked any angels to come close to you? No. No, well, you haven't got any, then. If any remedy is tested under controlled scientific conditions and proved to be effective, it will cease to be alternative and will simply become medicine. So-called alternative medicine either hasn't been tested or it has failed its tests. There wasn't a control, it was just an outcome. It was just a pilot study. Right. So that's not really a no, proper, no. proper trial. And some alternatives are funded by us taxpayers even though their unproven claims question the known laws of physics. You, know, you might think I'm gulling the patient. I don't claim that it's much more than a hypothesis. What I do say is that I have quite considerable evidence that homeopathy does work, and I'm sure that it's safe. Today, while we indulge unproven healing magic, tried and tested scientific medicine is under attack. In this program, I want to look at how health has become a battleground between reason and superstition. <sighs> you come here to move through time and through space. Allow the eyes to gently close. Smile your very best smile. Swallow the smile with some saliva into the heart and let the heart smile back at you. And there's a warm and a welcoming feeling. Joy without end, grace, beauty, laughter, the deep knowing of the wise being that you are, and the golden glow that comes from the heart comes from a golden flower, and use the gold light from the centre of the flower like a sunbeam, and beam it onto those petals and wake them up. There is a second part that's very personal, and this is to step inside the pearl itself. Because if you step inside the pearl, you could find out who you are. Elisis Livingston is a professional faith healer. She runs the Shambhala Retreat in Glastonbury. For £140 a day, she treats patients, including those with terminal cancer, with a mix of meditation, spiritual healing, and the playing of recorded chants. She believes she can alter the structure of DNA. Quite an experience. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. DNA is very interesting right now in our, the evolution of the human race. Um, Every human being, except um, a very small percentage, has a double helix in the cell. We and don't all have. Oh, everyone. You said a very small percentage. Oh, no, a very small percentage do not. Really? They have got more strands. Um, we used to have, in Atlantis, 12 strands, and they're in the form of four triangles facing in, in each cell. And we forgot who we were in the experiment after Atlantis, mm -hmm. and everything changed. Reincarnation was introduced. The soul I know what you're thinking. This woman is way out. I expected a serious program about the attack on science, and here's Richard Dawkins just picking on an easy target. But these ideas are not so weird in the irrational world of alternative health. In fact, they're commonplace. 
Is Elise's theory of DNA from Atlantis any more irrational than the Ayurvedic notion of chakras, seven spinning energy wheels inside us? They're certainly great money spinners. How do we know all this? Where, where does all this come from? Um, it comes from the Akashic record, the record of all vibration on this planet. Uh, we also have knowing. In, when we were doing the heart meditation, you go into the deep knowing. And the deep knowing, it really can't be argued. What you know, I know that you realise this, of course, you know. Well, I, I, I know that DNA is a double helix, but that's only been known since 1953. How is her evidence, the knowing of this Akashic record, any worse than the evidence for homeopathic claims that the more you dilute an active ingredient, the more effective it becomes? Both depend on faith. Apparently, I'm only a few DNA strands short of the full Atlantean quota. Elisis kindly agrees to top me up. So, let's put the last triangle in. And it's done. <laughs> Let me know in six months how you're feeling. I'll, 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 I'll wait and see if I get any any yes, any, any effects. <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, it's not all wacky quacky fun. Today, alternative or rather unproven remedies are fast becoming mainstream implicitly casting doubt on scientific medicine. Surveys reveal that a third of us spend an incredible 1.6 billion pounds a year on the kind of therapeutic stabs in the dark touted here in Glastonbury. It's mostly angels. I want to find out why such superstitious nonsense is mounting a growing challenge to scientific medicine. Once, society exalted scientists as heroes. Their insights fuel tangible progress, from clean water to networked computing, self-evident benefits that we now take for granted. Yet, as science has moved on, it's become more complex and difficult to grasp. It's easier to portray scientists as the people who bring us Frankenstein food, pollute the environment, or conduct sinister experiments on defenseless little animals. In the war being fought against reason, even medicine is now under attack. Media cause celebre, from side effects to superbugs, have bred widespread cynicism about medical progress. So much so, that in 1998, the publicizing of one survey of 12 children that wrongly linked MMR vaccine with autism prompted hundreds of thousands of parents to opt their children out of entirely sensible inoculations. A hyped up insinuation that the government and the medical establishment were conspiring to sacrifice our next generation to autism has left up to a fifth of our children entirely unprotected against rubella, mumps and measles, a disease with complications such as brain injury and deafness. This is what measles looks like, a potentially fatal illness now in... The number of parents inoculating their children with MMR quickly There have now been epidemics in Kent and Yorkshire and a first death from measles in 14 years. Now everybody's more confused because muddies the water. It's frightening. See the boy on the telly in there. It's an acute example of the danger of devaluing evidence. Where once there was reason, now there is confusion. One of the things that struck me right from the outset 
was how extraordinary it was that this scare got abroad when there were, it was so insubstantial. I mean, there was really no scientific basis for it whatsoever. I find it very easy to sympathise with patients who were scared, partly because the media built it up, but also because having your child vaccinated is a positive act. It's something that you did to the child. And so somehow that's, that's more scary than, than, than a sin of omission very much and I think that's even more the case these days when people are much less familiar with the diseases against which their children have been protected by immunization you know it's a generation or two since people had much experience of measles and mumps and rubella on any significant scale and so when somebody comes along and says well you know this immunization may cause some other problem then they're more likely to be susceptible to that why do you think that sort of thing happens in our society today I think that there's a climate of anxiety, but particularly focused on issues of health. Uh, generally, people feel, I think, more isolated, more atomized, more individuated perhaps than they did before. And these anxieties and concerns often focus on their health. This is a paradox of early 21st century life. We now have the luxury of irrational anxiety about our health and can dabble in faddish, unscientific remedies, precisely because scientific medicine allows us to live longer and more healthily. Our fears are fed by newspapers, which wildly exaggerate the risks of scientific medicine and meanwhile churn out acres of positive coverage of alternative therapies. In any other field, politics, say, or the next move on interest rates, journalists would ask hard questions and demand answers. But alternative medicine has managed to lodge itself in the less rigorous lifestyle and celebrity pages, essentially free advertising. It's little wonder that alternative health fairs like this are flourishing across the country. What, what's your line? What do you say? Uh, magnetic therapy. What is psychic energy? What are these wands used for? People may come here with real health problems, but what do they get? remedies that appear to have no basis in science or evidence. People putting these in a cat's bed, they'll find the animals will go to the bed with the magnets in it. Has that, that been done properly with controlled trials, is it? No, not been controlled trials. They've got ancient wisdom that we don't. Right. <laughs> I've always liked the saying that we should be open-minded, but not so open-minded that our brain falls out. So do we all have an angel hovering on our shoulder or something? Is that we what have several. Right. Yes. 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 OK, can, uh, how many have I got? Can, can you tell? Or, or do... Have you asked any angels to come close to you? No. No, well, you haven't got any then. Oh, OK. The idea is yeah. that we all have some form of angelic guidance, angelic guidance, some form of guidance that help us travel our life path. You might need strength, you might need forgiveness, you might need hope all the way through your lifetime. And the angels, as we perceive them, are those energy bands. They're parts of ourselves, they're fragments of ourselves that we can call upon and amplify to help us walk our path. These energies are a little bit like tea. You can have herb teas, you can have decaf teas, you can have all sorts of different flavours and strengths and varieties of teas. But they're all Remember, this is a multi-billion pound industry. Yet, 80% of alternative remedies have never subjected themselves to controlled scientific trials. They depend entirely on subjective word of mouth. Oh, that feels nice. Hunches and private feeling, which may be prone to bias or possibly even delusion. The scientific method, by contrast, tests with objective experiment and statistical analysis what is effective and what is not. Individual scientists may or may not be honest, but science, with its safeguards of peer review and repeating experiment, has scrupulous honesty built into it by design. Science replaces private prejudice with publicly verifiable evidence. 
untested and unverified yet desperately seeking credibility, alternative remedies follow in the rich tradition of organized religion and set up intricate belief systems. They substitute real science with pseudoscience. Face up or face down? You face up right. and you sit here. Now just guide your head so you don't go. This matters because in the process they deny fact and misuse science. But that, isn't that pointing up? Oh, I just had to go there to check. In flaunting words like energy, vibration, vortex, they exploit and also distort some of science's great discoveries. The sleep, I'm sure, is therapeutic. But how could these illuminated crystals be energizing my chakras, as advertised? Manjia Samantha Lawton is a conventionally trained former GP who now speculates on the science behind alternative fads. She asserts that chakras in our bodies are something like black holes. Yes, as in the big ones that suck in everything in space. We used to think of black holes as the great guzzlers of the universe, that they actually um, started to, uh, to suck in everything around it. Uh, what we're finding now is that black holes are in the centre of every single galaxy and they occur in all sizes. So black holes have become into a creative principle. A, a creative principle? A creative principle. What does that mean? That we're realising that black holes have something to do with creating matter in the galaxy. And this is very, very new. And uh, what I'm suggesting is that black holes are creative at every level, even within our own bodies, which is what perhaps the chakras are. So whereabouts yeah. in, in my body might there be a black hole? Well, the idea from esoteric knowledge is that chakras are centres in the body that are um, spinning, which is why they're called wheels, chakras. And uh, there are different colours and they relate to different parts of the body. So there are traditionally seven chakras at different parts of the body. The universe is a deeply mysterious place and a deeply wonderful place and scientists have always been struggling to understand it. Don't you feel that there's enough real mystery to investigate without importing what sounds to me horribly like mumbo-jumbo? Yes, I can understand that you think it's mumbo-jumbo, but there's plenty of people who are now getting interested in these topics. They are part of our universe. Okay, well, and certainly part of the they universe, are part of the universe. Whether what they do has any value, I mean, um, that's up to you. <laughs> well, it's not really up to me. It's up to science, and it's, it's up, up to, to evidence. It's and, up to science. What worries me is the beguiling misuse of scientific language to prop up entirely unscientific belief systems. In the Middle Ages, healers would conjure up evil spirits or magical spells. Now, in the 21st century, it seems they turn to black holes and, above all, quantum physics. Quantum theory accounts for the anomalous behaviour of light and atoms. It's astonishingly accurate, but notoriously difficult to grasp. But Deepak Chopra, who once qualified as a doctor, has seized upon quantum jargon and applied it to healing. He claims disease can be caused and cured by a shift in consciousness. If you believe in the rock, you're automatically believing in God. Chopra has managed to become a one-man alternative health industry. He's worth up to $75,000 per lecture, and in this era of self-absorption, he claims Michael Jackson, Madonna, and Hillary Clinton as followers. If you feel genuinely attractive, you'll attract other people to you. The great American physicist Richard Feynman once said, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. Isn't Deepak Chopra just exploiting quantum jargon as plausible-sounding hocus-pocus? 
Quantum healing is a theory that a shift in consciousness creates a shift in biology. That's it. We try and get into every aspect of a patient's life, their relationships, their hopes, their dreams, and uh, then we combine it with a ritual of um, deep meditation, massage, and really a lot of spiritual counseling, including the fear of death. We think that uh, many times uh, patients uh, uh, feel healed even though they may die from a disease if they learn to go beyond their personal fear of death. And you can never do that unless you uh, have a patient have a spiritual experience. Where did the quantum theory come into that? I... Oh, it's just a metaphor, just like uh, an electron or a photon is an indivisible unit of information and energy. A thought is an indivisible unit of consciousness. Oh, so it's, an, it's a metaphor for a, for a unit. It's nothing to do with quantum theory as in physics. No, I think quantum theory has a lot of uh, things to say about observer effect. There are a school of physicists who believe that quantum leaps, for example, are examples of discontinuity. And uh, creativity in consciousness is also an example of discontinuity. And that healing may be a biological phenomenon that uh, relies on biological creativity, that at very fundamental levels it may be a discontinuous phenomenon. It's something unpredictable that happens in the proliferation of uncertainty. So it sounds like a sort of poetic use of the word discontinuity. It's, it's actually confusion, isn't it, to bring in um, quantum theory other than as a metaphor. But it sounds as though you're both doing it as a metaphor and a, a little tinge of, of something like what physicists are talking about as well. Well, I think there's controversy. The aficionados in the world of quantum physics have somehow hijacked the word for their own use. Oh, okay. So they've hijacked your word I quantum. think what happens is that there are fundamentalists in science. Right. That is absolutely wrong. Science's quest is to try to sort out, to tease out those bits that we don't and understand. Science and work has become out. so arrogant in its um, in its premise that it has all the answers in a mechanistic approach that it has, whilst it has gotten rid of lots of things like polio and malaria and tuberculosis in many parts of the world, uh, we are now seeing the emergence of modern epidemics that are a result of some of the things that have come about through science. Chopra at least wears his disdain for Western science openly. The rest of us are prone to politely blurring the vital distinction between science and mumbo-jumbo. If you want to pay for unproven potions and use them in the privacy of your own home, all well and good. But such is the power of the alternative medical lobby that one seemingly bizarre remedy has become embedded in our national health service. Now I want to find out why we're all paying tax to fund other people's gullibility. I agree there is a plausibility problem, you know, and I pinch myself from time to time. I quite regularly pinch myself. You know, is this really happening? It's the hottest alternative health fad. It boasts an impressively vast and well-stocked medical cabinet. It's endorsed by royalty and the stars and is doing a booming trade in high street pharmacies. 500 million people worldwide claim to use it. What is it? It's a system for dosing up on a dilute solution of water. Welcome to the bizarre world of homeopathy. Homeopathy was dreamed up in the late 18th century as a way of boosting the body's vital spirit. One of the central tenets handed down by its founder, Samuel Hahnemann, was that like cures like. Superficially, this might sound faintly plausible, but unlike a vaccine that introduces a diminished form of a virus into the body in order to provoke its immune system, like cures like makes the unfounded assumption that what causes similar symptoms can cure those symptoms. In Hahnemann's world, dilute poison ivy cures skin rash because, undiluted, it causes a rash if touched. By the same principle, red onion can alleviate streaming eyes and snake venom stiffness. But amazingly, homeopathy gets even stranger still. 
Homeopaths claim that the more you dilute an active ingredient in water, the stronger medicine it becomes. Most homeopathic remedies are marked 30C. What does that mean? It means one part medicine to a hundred to the power of 30 parts water. How much? A drop in a fish tank? No? A fish tank is nowhere near big enough. The swimming pool doesn't provide enough dilution. Not even a lake. What about a drop in the ocean? But it turns out that even the sea isn't big enough. For the really approved homeopathic recipes, in order to get one molecule of the active substance, you need to imbibe all the atoms in the solar system. To science, just doesn't make sense. Even homeopaths acknowledge that there is not a single molecule of active ingredient in the bottle they sell you. It's just water. So how can it possibly work? In an attempt to resolve the paradox, homeopathy boldly paddles further up the creek of pseudoscience, claiming that water somehow has a memory of the now completely absent active ingredient. But wouldn't water also have memory of other, more common impurities it's come into contact with? Salt, urine. Scientists have calculated that in each glass of water we drink, at least one molecule has passed through the bladder of Oliver Cromwell. Incredibly, you and I are paying for this unproven industry through our taxes. Despite the National Health Service's net £540 million deficit for 2006, the refurbishment of the Royal Homeopathic Hospital was part funded by the NHS to the tune of £10 million. That's equivalent to 500 nurses' salaries. Right here on the floor, here's a point to illustrate. Wooden floors, very unusual in a modern healthcare facility. This hospital was only completed 18 months ago. So this is our main clinical area. The homeopathic profession is unregulated by government. You can call yourself a homeopath without any qualification, training or even insurance. After all, all you're doing is dishing out water solution. But Peter Fisher, clinical director of the hospital, is a medically trained rheumatologist. I see Prince Charles over there. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yes, great friend of ours. <laughs> These are the, the homeopathic medicines that are in you know, daily use. This is one, you know, for instance, it has quite a strong evidence base, rust toxin, which is poison ivy. Right, OK. Um, I want to know how someone highly qualified in real medicine can make such a leap of faith. I agree there is a plausibility problem, you know, and I pinch myself from time to time. I quite regularly pinch myself. You know, is this really happening? You know, the fact is I couldn't stop what I do now, even if I wanted to. This, my patients wouldn't let me. Yeah. They say it helped. So how are things? Well, very much better since we last saw you. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I virtually no pain at all. You know, if I'm aware of the symptoms are going to start again, I start taking it again and, and I can feel the improvement and then mm -hmm. I go back to it until I need it again, you know. Good. Oh, well, that's pretty straightforward. We just bash on the same, don't we? Yeah. I'm still taking the remedies, but you said to me, um, you know, if you get mini, if you get little reactions, mm. just hold off taking the remedies until they then uh, yeah. subside. So therefore, I've been doing that. So, for example, I haven't had a remedy for a week now. And uh, last time we met, you said you were getting a bit of an emotional sort of upset yeah. the day after you took the, the medicine. It was the day after I took the medicine. That's I was impressed by the amount of time and care Peter Fisher devotes to each patient, far more than an ordinary doctor. Um, but in terms of the treatment, I would be you know, reluctant to make a big change. I think this is the right stuff and we may need to fiddle around with it. Like a GP, Peter Fisher prescribes medicine. But in this case, the medicine is a bit of a surprise. Thank you very much. Good. Common salt, natrium muriatic and sodium chloride, again in an ultramolecular dilution. I mean, obviously, since it's common salt, I mean, she's obviously taking in a hell of a lot of common salt anyway. Yes, oh, sure. Um, how, how does the one 
Well, the truth is nobody knows. I don't know, nor does anybody else. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question is, do you think that because we don't know, because it seems implausible, it can't work? And that may be where you and I differ. That's Actually, right. the most recent problem was your skin, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, my hands, they've cleared up quite well. And my scalp's in, in, yeah. a lot, lot better. While patients like these provide positive anecdotes for homeopathy, subjective stories are not enough for science. I want to pin down precisely what double-blind trials have been conducted. Over a hundred have been done, some by me. On the whole, they're positive. And I have, you know, I, I've worked hard on it. Um, but in the face of great scepticism, in the face of many people who say, oh, well, yeah, we're not going to fund homeopathy, it's got to be a load of rubbish. Why do you think they say that if there really are controlled trials which... which uh, well, I think you're, you're, you're a much better place to comment on because you're the sort of person who says that. Well, because I, I have read studies which have sort of meta-analyses and things which suggest that, yes, occasionally there's a slight suggestion of something, maybe in a slight suggestion there, but if you take the, all the studies that have been done, it doesn't add up in the way that... Oh, I, I don't ag agree with that at all. Now, if a double-blind controlled trial really does show that it works, then that suggests we're dealing with an entirely new force of physics, something unknown to science. Well, I think there's a slight exaggeration. I mean, there are, there are various hypotheses. Remarkably, nobody knows what the structure of liquid water is. So there is, there is room, you know, for, for a phenomenon analogous to, I'm not saying the same, but analogous to the storage of information by a magnetic medium, by a floppy disk or a videotape. Yes. If I were a doctor, doing what you do and was convinced that it really worked, I would, I would drop everything and really, really try to demonstrate it and, and win the Nobel Prize for physics. I and mean, it would be an astonishing, totally astonishing uh, finding. That's, uh, to be honest, one of the main reasons I got into it. Plain ambition got me into it in the first place. But I agree, it would be nice to see, you know, a really serious program of research done, done on it. Well, it, you're saying it has been done and... Well, no, I'm saying that quite a lot of research ha has been done it's, I don't claim it's conclusive. Well, why, why not? I mean, it sounds as though... Well, because it's very diffuse. And, of course, it does depend what question you're asking. You know, are you saying, does it benefit people? Do people feel better? And I think, actually, there's, there's no doubt about that, that, that people who, who go to homeopathic hospitals who have homeopathic treatment do feel better. But, of course, you will say that's all because you're nice to them. This is all rather contradictory, so let's be clear about the latest evidence. In 2005, the medical journal The Lancet surveyed all the meta-analyses, the analyses of the analyses, and failed to find any reliable effect of homeopathy. Tellingly, for me, in the bigger trials, less prone to chance anomalies, homeopathy was more likely to show zero demonstrable effect. And yet, despite the lack of robust evidence, homeopathy thrives. Many clinicians look on in horror at the unlevel playing field of trials and evidence for medical licensing. In 2004, American trials seemed to show that the drug Herceptin could halve the death rate for a particularly virulent form of breast cancer. This was a major breakthrough. Patients understandably clamored for the new drug, but unlike in the world of homeopathy, the claims of scientific medicine are tested rigorously, and that takes time. Accordingly, the license was delayed. We went through a period of a year or two when Herceptin, quite rightly in my opinion, uh, was held up for the treatment of breast cancer until all the evidence was there. So we had extremely rigid cost-effectiveness analysis before we could use Herceptin. And, okay, there was a short passage of time when it seemed unfair. But you compare that when actually lives are lost because we're talking about life-threatening disease with drugs which actually save lives to the way that ineffective, irrational remedies are just being nodded through. I mean, it makes you weep. The pharmaceutical industry takes a lot of knocks. And yes, drugs are very expensive. But the reason they're so expensive is there may be 20 years of R&D to get to an effective product. Every step of the way is checked and double checked. And now through the back door, we're getting a class of compound being allowed into the marketplace with a license with no such evidence of efficacy. I can't understand how you could even... But if homeopathy isn't tested properly or flunks its trials, then why do homeopaths remain popular?
substances. A lot of them owe their success not to the homeopathy, but to the fact they are decent people. They have time, they're compassionate, they look the patient in the eye, they talk to someone for an hour. These are nice people. I would like to recruit these really nice people to practice proper medicine. And then in the end, what we've got are proper doctors, empathetic doctors, who will, in addition to the placebo effect of being that kind of physician, they can also add in truly effective drugs. Clinical trials show that homeopathy simply cannot match up with safe chemical drugs. Yet in the realm of petty ailments like sore eyes or itchy scalp, homeopathy is probably innocent enough. Because it's really all about attentive doctors spending time listening to the patient. That one is still, the right one is still a tiny bit puffy, isn't it? Or is it? Well, it's always like that. Then giving them something that makes them feel better, precisely because it's supposed to make them feel better. I think it's all down to the placebo effect. I want to find out if that's the key to alternative medicine's grip on public confidence. I would disagree with you that I think something is being done. And why are we so good at placebo and the orthodox medicine and oh, not? Oh, well, they're, they're pretty good at it too. Alternative health remedies are swamping us. We've seen how most are not properly tested, how they undermine science and delude the public. Hi. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. You want a health kinesiology session? I'd like to, yes, you please. You know what it is? Um, I'm hoping to learn. OK. Have a lie down. But the irony may be that in this very delusion lies their success. What we do in kinesiology is we clear energy blockages in the meridian system. There are 14 meridians or energy pathways that run up and down the body. Can they be seen um, with a microscope? Can you sort of um, look at them? And, I don't no. think so. No. I don't think so. No, okay. okay. Unlike the library, all right, I've got all these energy patterns yes, okay. stored in me, and you are yeah. just picking the one okay. that you want. And we have baker's yeast here, all right? So I'm just going to touch a point right by your ear. This is the test for allergy. There's just no tension. It just releases completely. OK, you want this fixed? Yes, please. OK. I have to admit I'm rather enjoying this kinesiology. I feel very relaxed. But what is helping me here? The tapping of my feet? The feel of a kind woman's hands? or some sort of expectation that what it's doing is therapeutic. What I'm talking about is the placebo effect, treatment through the power of suggestion. And I'm going to hold points on your head, OK? Right here and here. And what I want you to do is think the phrase, fear of being ignored. Human beings have evolved extraordinarily sophisticated self-healing mechanisms. Above all, a powerful immune system. Fear of being ignored. Could it be that interaction with any kind of healer acts to focus our self-healing abilities? Some evolutionary psychologists believe this may be the entirely rational explanation behind irrational remedies. works because most of medicine, in fact, is a case of self-cure. When we, the pain goes down after taking placebo medicine, or under the influence of acupuncture, for example, it's our own minds which have reduced the pain. Yes, surely what you're saying is that we get better anyway. Why then would alternative medicine be better? Surely it, an, an ordinary doctor might do that. Real medicine does the same. But I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, underestimate the powers, and sometimes the superior powers, of people who go under funny names or have funny authorities written up on the wall and so on, because some people respond to that information much more than they would to the conventional information in a doctor's surgery. Nevertheless, I sort of have a sort of hankering after what's actually true. How far do you think so-called alternative practitioners believe the mumbo-jumbo that they, that they say is the theory behind their potions and how far do they know that it's a placebo? Are, are they deceiving or are they self-deceiving? 
I think in many cases they're self-deceiving. Well, it's not even self-deceiving. They have seen in their own experience that these treatments work, so they believe in them. Um, they have then to invent a rationale, some spiritual or magical explanation of what they're doing. You know, supposing you were a miracle worker in the two or three thousand years ago, supposing you were Jesus and seeing that you know, lame men got up and walked when you told them to, you'd be rather impressed with yourself, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, yes. Um, and but I'm sure it was yeah. a placebo effect. Yes, quite. Right. Yes. <laughs> I still believe scientific medicine offers more effective and more honest treatment. But I accept Nick Humphrey's point that alternative medicine is peculiarly well positioned to dish out placebos. In the 24-7 globalized rat race of the 21st century, people are yearning for time out. Visiting an alternative healer provides an hour for unwinding and contemplation. And if you're lucky, exposure to piped whale music. Much of alternative medicine is about cosseting, about making the patient feel pampered, feel as though they're the center of attention. Okay, so comfort's the name of the game here, yeah? so get as comfortable as you can. So literally all I want you to do is just to relax your head, let it go. So the first thing I have to do is very gently cup and hold here. Now you don't feel like I'm not doing anything, but it's a very gentle movement. While in our hard-pressed National Health Service, the patient-doctor encounter lasts on average just eight minutes... See the rotation on your left? Yes. Look at the rotation on your right. It's restricted. Yes. So this is called an activate. An alternative healer usually gives you an hour. OK. In return for a healthy fee, of course. The Hale Clinic near London's Harley Street offers a huge array of healing arts, ancient and modern. Many may make you think you feel better without having real effect in themselves. In other words, they're placebos. If I were wanting to exploit the placebo effect, then I would do exactly what you're doing. I would have uh, a large number of different things which look impressive, sound good, mm. use long words, talk about quantum theory, mm. lights flashing. Um, and the whole point mm. is to impress the patient. The whole point is to make the patient feel that something is, is being done. But, but something is being done. I mean, I, I, I would disagree with you. That I, th I think something is being done. And why are we so good at placebo and the orthodox medicine is oh, not? Oh, well, they're, they're pretty good at it, too. And, I, mean, <laughs> I, I find when I, when I go to my doctor and, yes. and, and he just talks to me, mm. I seem to be miraculously cured mm. uh, as a, as a well, consequence. Well, that's very, very important. It is very but important. But maybe he's, a, he's giving you some healing energy and you don't know. Well, he wouldn't call it that. Yes, I, mean, I he know would, he wouldn't call it that, yes. but it could be. It's very, very important to talk, to find out, to take a proper case history. But I don't think it's the only reason. I think complementary medicine has effect over and above that, yeah. in my opinion. Yes. Um, do you ever do, do clinical trials on, on your, your methods, or do, do people come in and, and do, do them for you? We've done one study uh, at Hammersmith Hospital on stroke patients um, that was funded. Uh, quite a few years ago. And uh, what treatment were you giving them? We were giving um, an Ayurvedic treatment called Mama Massage. And yes. uh, this, it was only a pilot study and it showed an improvement in a certain number of patients. So what, what was the control in that case? It, there wasn't a control, it was just an outcome. It was just, it was just a pilot study. So that's not really a, no, pro no. a proper trial. Do you think there's a bit of a double standard? Doctors have to spend six years qualifying mm -hmm. and so on. Isn't it just a bit too easy to set yourself up in practice um, without qualifications and without... Um... Which ones were you thinking? Well, um, what about the Ayurvedic one, for example? Well, there's a four-year degree course here. What, what, do they learn? what do they learn? They learn the principles of Ayurveda. They will learn anatomy and physiology. I mean, it's one of the oldest systems of medicine in the world, Ayurveda. It's old, yes. It doesn't make it good, though, does it? No, but it, it shows it has a lot of experience. The idea that ancient equals years of accumulated wisdom is a fallacy. It's a teasing irony that the moneyed classes in the rich West are indulging superseded Hindu healing magic when, back in India, people are voting with their feet and opting for modern vaccines and antibiotics. Resuscitating Ayurveda today is rather like bringing back bleeding with leeches.
In medicine, ancient also means developed before we understood the causes of disease, before germ theory. It was based on ignorance then, and age makes it no truer. We misguidedly look back to a golden age that never was. Ours is the golden age of safe, tested medicine, effective beyond placebo, in which we've cut infant mortality and conquered diseases, then forgotten they existed. Let's hear it for Western scientific medicine. In the 20th and 21st centuries, we've all but eliminated terrible diseases like polio, completely eradicated smallpox by a worldwide program of vaccination, antibiotics, well, I wouldn't be here but for antibiotics, and I guess there's a good chance that you wouldn't be either. Blood transfusions, magnificent surgery, all these things are given to us by scientific principles, scientifically trained doctors, all the methods are properly tested and retested. None of that could be said for so-called alternative medicine. The indulgence of superstitious alternative remedies implicitly casts doubt on scientific advance and undermines confidence in real medical progress. Yet, as we've seen, the attack on medicine is just one small part of the creeping rise of irrational superstition. In Ayurveda or clairvoyance, homeopathy or astrology, we're confronted by those who deny evidence of the real world and instead bend reality around a dogmatic belief system handed down by tradition. Skeptical, rational inquiry is always the best approach. We don't have to follow the herd and buy into trendy, untested health fads. We don't have to be swayed this way and that by media-driven health scares. Instead, we can think independently and be truly open-minded. That means asking questions, being open to real corroborated evidence. Reason has liberated us from superstition and given us centuries of progress. We abandon it at our peril. Well, if you missed any of tonight's Enemies of Reason, see it again on our new Channel 4 Plus One service, starting in a couple of minutes. Next up, Channel 4 meets people who amazingly have lived across three centuries, the oldest people in the world.